for being here and coming to this press conference on gun violence pre prevention as we introduce the Taylor Hayden Gun Violence Prevention Act and other public safety legislation. Before I tell you a little bit about Taylor, I want to sincerely thank everyone who has worked on this legislation and advocated to reduce gun violence in our community. I want to thank you to my family and Taylor's, my stepmother Joyce, Taylor's grandmother, Mrs. Stallings. I have my sister Sydney's here. I think my sister Erin. Oh, it's right here. <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, fantastic to see them and thank you for all the support that you've given our family uh, over the last uh, few months. I also want to thank some of my fellow legislators are here. I see Senator Latz is here, Senator Champion, uh, Senator Desick, Senator Schoen, Representative Fuli, Representative Dave Pinto. I'm hoping I haven't missed any. Huh? Oh, Representative Baker Finn, I'm sorry. I know. Um, I also want to uh, say thank you to Lucy Macbeth, the mother of Jordan Davis, for your tireless work and unspeakable grief. And to all the survivors of gun violence to, to, who find strength to advocate for change. Also, um, I couldn't have done this, obviously, without the organizing power of Moms Demand Action, Every Town, Protect Minnesota, and all the, all the organizations that grieve for families that have lost, that have been lost to violence. I um, also want to just acknowledge some of the members of our law enforcement community. I won't catch them all, but I will catch the chiefs. Uh, we have Minneapolis Chief Janae Harto, thank you. Uh, St. Paul Police Chief Paul Axtell. Maplewood uh, Chief Paul Schnell, he's just been in the news because of gun violence. Uh, Metro Transit, former Senator Chief John Harrington, and then also our County Attorney Mike Freeman. Uh, thank you uh, so much for being here. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, a little bit about Taylor, and I'll let my family members kind of fill in. Um, as many of you know, last July, uh, my sister uh, Taylor, uh, native Minnesotan, wife of a uh, high school graduate, uh, recently moved to Houston, Texas to take a job uh, there. And uh, as all of us have done, she got with a group of her friends, and they decided to take a weekend out of town, and that was in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, they went in... Uh, did what young people do. They went shopping, they went to go eat, uh, and then they went uh, out for uh, some dancing and fun. And uh, as they were leaving the place where they uh, had eaten and, and were, were having fun, uh, gunfire erupted between two parties that were, you know, apparently uh, having a problem. Um, we think that it was uh, maybe a narcotic sale gone wrong, but they're still investigating that. Um, and as they... Uh, were shooting at each other, they ran into the crowd and essentially used my sister as a human shield. And uh, so she was hit twice and was killed. Um, and uh, we uh, got that call, my folks, my parents. I also want to make sure you guys know that, uh, many of you guys know my father, Peter Hayden, he is just uh, recuperating uh, from some surgery, but he would be here and he sends his best as well. Um, but we got the call, they got the call, and they called me uh, and said, that at the age of 25, she had passed away. So Taylor was what every, every what she, she represented everything that we want our children to represent. She went to school, she graduated, she went to college, she graduated, she went on, she started a career, uh, she had her first apartment, she had uh, her first car, if you will, the, you know, the one that she bought, she did everything that we would ask our uh, children to do. And my folks raised, as you can see, my lovely sisters here uh, in a loving environment, and they worked hard to give them uh, everything that they would need to survive and to do well. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the reckless use of a firearm, she's no longer with us. So um, to the bill, really quick before I, I know we have a lot of speakers, uh, what we thought was uh, to develop a bill, and, um, and the bill would actually be about gun violence prevention and outreach, and essentially having a conversation with our community to kind of get people to understand what happens when you use a gun, to get people to think about the ramifications for them, and to get upstream from this problem. Um, we have done a tremendous amount of work and to try to figure out how to deal with it. We have law enforcement here who comes and investigates and tries 
to make sure that people get ju- that families get justice and people get the penalties. But what I'm hoping that this would do would be a start of a new conversation that really talked about what gun what happens with gun violence and are there other ways that we can deal with our issues rather than shoot each other. So that's what the bill essentially does. It just appropriates two hundred thousand dollars per year um, to the Commission of Human Service. We think about this as a public health crisis uh, to then work on an RFP and find organizations that do this work uh, and hopefully they can go out into the most affected communities and have a conversation and hopefully prevent gun violence. The last thing I'll say is we always said that if one person dies, it's too many. And last July, I really understood that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my stepmom, Joyce Hayden, and uh, the rest of the uh, speakers. Good morning and thank you for being here. Um, just a couple of things that I'd like to share with you about Taylor. Today is her birthday. She would have been 26 years old today. Um, and so that's a very difficult thing for us to think about. Um, she's gone, and um, she won't be here anymore. She won't get to celebrate another birthday here. Um, so we felt it was very appropriate to celebrate Taylor. We want to celebrate her. We want people to understand that gun violence has to end. It has to end. We can no longer keep saying, oh, that's too bad. We have to say, let's stop it. Let's figure out ways to help all of us understand that we don't need to use a gun to settle our differences. We don't need to use a gun to make threats or to injure or hurt or kill someone. We don't need to do that. We are better than that. We can be better than that. We should be better than that. Let's end gun violence. And we, as her family, want to end gun violence in Taylor's name. Thank you. Next up, we'll have uh, the chief of the Minneapolis Police Department, Janae Hartog. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, my sympathies to the Hayden family. Uh, I am actually very humbled to be here today and just say a few words. The Minneapolis Police Department officers see the effects of gun violence every day. We talk to grieving victims. We talk to scared or concerned residents. We run into people who don't want to talk to cops about what they've witnessed. Every day, I look at a picture of three-year-old Terrell Mays that sits on my desk. Terrell was killed the day after Christmas, 2011. He was running upstairs to hide in the bathtub after he heard gunfire outside of his home. His mom continues to talk to anyone who will listen as this case needs to be solved. Marsha Mays deserves justice. Terrell, her son, did not deserve to die. He was an unintended victim of senseless gun violence. Burdell Beeks was also an unintended victim. She was 58. She was killed in May of last year, hit by crossfire as she drove her teenage granddaughter she had taken to an appointment. She was a mother and a grandmother. I remember that feeling in my stomach when I got the call. I remember how that senseless death made me feel I am a mother. We arrested someone and he has been charged, but it doesn't change the effect of this violence on the Beeks family. She wasn't an intended target, but she was in the area where groups were shooting at each other. No regard for the lives of others in the area. When we look at that same geographic area, our weapons investigators connected one gun one gun to 10 other shootings. That's over the course of 15 months. This gun was passed around between several people within the same group. In those 10 incidents, we found more than 60 shell casings, and, we talk, and we're actually talking about 12 victims connected to that one gun. We continue to dedicate uniformed police officers, investigators, use community strategies to try to combat and prevent gun violence but we need more effective regulation. We need more community-driven strategies. Gun violence isn't a city of Minneapolis problem. It touches every corner of our state and every corner of this nation. This isn't about taking away anyone's rights. It's about preserving rights while protecting people. I'm proud to stand here to support any measures that can help save lives. Mothers should never have to bury their children.
Thank you, Chief. Next up, we have State Representative Fooley. Thank you, Mrs. Hayden, Senator Hayden, and Chief Arto. I am honored to be a part of this important effort to pass the Taylor Hayden Gun Violence Prevention Act. Every week in the United States, 645 people lose their lives to firearm violence, and 1,565 more are treated in emergency departments for fire-related injuries. Firearms are the second leading cause of injury death for youth 17 and under. Firearm injury is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly a male problem with males accounting for 86% of deaths and 90% of non-fatal injuries. And every month in America, 52 women are shot and killed by their current or former partners. Gun violence is a part of our communities, but it doesn't have to be. We have an extensive criminal justice system that deals with the punishment of gun violence. We have advocates working all across the state to support victims and survivors of gun violence. And now we need to be more intentional ab about supporting the design and implementation of programs that get ahead of it and work to prevent it. When we look beyond homicide and consider all gun violence and deaths, including unintentional shootings and suicide, we have a better understanding as to how our communities can fight back. We must look at societal factors and at all of our laws. We must advocate for a multifaceted approach that considers all determinants of violence. We must look as, as society as a whole, our smaller communities, individuals, and the situations where gun violence occurs, and we must work tirelessly to get ahead of it. The Taylor Hayden Gun Violence Prevention Bill is where we need to start. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lee. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Rami Magid. Thank you to the Hayden family and to Moms Demand Action in every town for your work. Um, I'm Dr. Rami Magid. I've been a physician for nearly seven years, a board certified pediatrician serving in Minnesota for four of those years. As a pediatrician, I'm tasked with partnering with parents to protect children and to help them thrive and achieve their full potential. As you know, there are countless dangers confronting our kids daily from playground injuries to bullying to motor vehicle accidents, but no source of danger is so horrific, so deadly, so preventable and senseless as the danger of guns. Every two hours in America, someone's child is killed with a gun, whether a homicide, suicide, or unintentional injury. One out of every 25 admissions to pediatric trauma centers in our nation is due to a gunshot wound. These are the tragedies we see every day in our emergency rooms and our intensive care unit. Gun violence is a public health crisis in America. In a recent study by the World Health Organization, they compared 10 years of violent death rates in the US and other countries that were most like in terms of income, education, and health. Of all the people killed by firearms in all the countries included, 82% were from the United States. That includes 90% of all the women killed, 91% of all the children 0 to 14, 92% of all the youth aged 15 to 24 killed. This is shameful. We need to reframe the debate about guns in our state and in our country. Let's have a meaningful conversation based on evidence, not on fear-mongering rhetoric, and about the cost of gun violence to our community, especially our children. As adults, we must be willing to come to the table to collectively work on common sense legislation that prioritizes our children's lives above special interests. We must work together, our lawmakers, hunters, law enforcement, doctors, nurses, parents, caregivers, to keep our children safe. This is the very least they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Next up, we have a county attorney, Hennepin County Attorney, Mike Freeman. Well, thank you, Senator, and I'm glad to be here with my brothers and sisters from law enforcement, legislators, it's good to be back to be here with you, and the fine groups that are represented here, Moms Demand Action Every Town, and all of the organizations who seek to end gun violence. On behalf of the County Attorneys Association and myself, we work hard every day on people who commit crimes and use guns in violent ways. 
And we do our very best, and I think we do a pretty good job. But we need every tool we can get. And in honor of Taylor and the family, this is a great idea. We have some money, $200,000 a year, which is a drop in the bucket, senators and representatives. And I know because I sat in the Senate Finance Committee. It's, it's a drop in the bucket, but it's an important drop because there are organizations out there that can help start and enhance the dialogue. How do we stop violence? Well, sure, we can put people in prison and put them away. But how do we really stop it? We talk to people about one gun, violence makes no sense. We talk to people about turning their guns in, and we talk about a more sane society. That's what we can do. This $200,000 make a real difference, and I'm honored to be here with everyone. Let's get this done. Next up, we have Representative Dave Pinto. Uh, good morning, and, and uh, thank you to all, all of you for being here. I want to uh, kind of take a parochial moment for just a second and thank especially Chief Todd Axtell from the St. Paul Police Department. I'm really grateful to have such leadership in, uh, in my community. So I have a unique perspective here. I'm both a legislator and I'm also a prosecutor, and those two roles, um, uh, keeping the community safe, is a key component, a key part of my job in both those responsibilities. And I can say without a doubt, we need more resources to get ahead of gun violence. Um, right now, we're just chasing the tail. We're dealing with the consequences. We need more funding for community intervention, right? We need the strongest foundation possible around gu how guns are bought and sold in our system. And we also need a way, though, to acknowledge that sometimes, sometimes, people need help at the uh, intersection of untreated mental health and gun ownership the intersection between those. I'm proud to be the House author of the criminal background check bill you'll be hearing about in a bit, and also the gun violence protection prevention order, or GVPO. This is a good bill, and this is one that Minnesotans need. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, there are so many cases that are brought to court, so many cases I see, and uh, my fellow prosecutors, where there are many red flags, or victim survivors, family members, others have said, if only we had a way to stop it before it happened. Uh, we saw all these warning signs. We didn't know what to do. And I've seen the very tragic evidence of this and consequences of this in my work. Uh, the GVPO would enable family members and law enforcement to petition a court to temporarily prohibit an individual from possessing firearms if that person is a significant danger to themselves or to others by having the firearm. It provides a clear legal pathway for family members and law enforcement, as I said, to get help that addresses safety concerns articulable and definable concerns that folks have about safety, not hearsay. Nationwide, 60 to 65 percent of gun deaths are suicide. We focus so often on homicide, but suicide. In Minnesota, 80 to 85 percent of our annual gun deaths each year are suicide. We're 20 percent higher than the national average. So this law would have a really big impact. The GVPO, it's important to stress, is very specific. It focuses only on the relatively rare circumstance whereby mental illness concerns can escalate to dangerous behaviors, behaviors that seem unstoppable. Uh, I want to point out there's due process built in. It's temporary, and it gives the family and individual time to deal with the documented mental health crisis at hand without the stigma of a much more uh, uh, stronger measure of civil commitment uh, or, on the other hand, the threat of firearms. And I want to point out a particular case, the tragic case of uh, Michelle Plotz, um, and be easy to classify this case as simply domestic violence, but it was so much more. Um, Michelle Plotz's estranged boyfriend, Tim Hendricks, had been brought to the hospital for mental health concerns nearly a dozen times before he murdered her. A dozen times. In fact, the day before he killed her and attempted to kill her father, John, John had brought Tim to the hospital hoping to finally get a psychiatric evaluation for him, but they were unsuccessful. Tim Hendricks was able to get his hands on a gun because of the loopholes in our laws, and there was no way to legally take that gun away from him until after he had murdered Michelle, until after it was too late. So let me say that again. No legal way to remove the gun until after Michelle had been killed. Even though there were numerous warning signs that he might hurt her, their baby, or himself. Michelle's family and law enforcement didn't have any tools to keep her safe despite the clear and overwhelming evidence that her killer was in distress. There wasn't just one red flag in this heartbreaking tragedy. There were 12, right? In, a, in other states, it was a tragedy that prompted the establishment of a law like the GV, GVPO. We already had these tragedies in Minnesota. 
Michelle Potts' murder was devastating, and in just a minute, you're going to hear about Barbara Larson's murder. This is no less a tragedy. We can't wait for one more murder, one more death, before we take this simple step. We have to give families options where they feel they have none, especially with the recent rollback at the federal level that prohibited those receiving disability for mental health challenges from possessing guns. States, now more than ever, have to work to protect their communities. We should pass the GVPO bill. Thank you. I just want to take a little bit of a, uh, I guess of a, a bill author's uh, pri privy, uh, and I want to uh, bring up my very, very good friend and a very good friend of our family, uh, Senator Bobby Joe Champion, just to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that he has done as well as uh, what Taylor meant to him. Good morning. Uh, I am uh, a little emotional this morning because whenever you uh, lose a loved one or anyone for that matter, you are uh, challenged and you're challenged to your core and all the things that you, you don't want to face, you, you have to face. Uh, one other reason why this is challenging to me is because I'm very close to the family, obviously but also because I had a brother who was shot and killed because he was shot in the head. And he laid um, on his back outside of Peter Hayden's organization as he bled to death. There, there was a Northside nun who prayed for him before he passed. So all the work that I do around background checks and wanting to make sure that we get guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them, you know, whenever we lo lose someone, it only... Uh, makes it that much more real. And so I don't want to have to come back here and for us to say there's another person who lost their life or there's another family who's grieving. I think our values must re really reflect uh, what we do. You know, and if we believe this to be important, then it's important for us to all work together. And we work together in order to make tomorrow a better day. And so another family doesn't have to experience the challenge that we are experiencing. And the last thing that I'll say is sometimes when we are faced with a challenge, we, we sometimes get weary. But un un understand that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands at the time of convenience and comfort, but is where he stands at the time of challenge and controversy. So before us, we have a challenge, but it's up to us to join hand in hand in order to make uh, Taylor's life, uh, a true reflection of, 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 of change. And so thank you, Senator Hayden, for the opportunity to speak briefly, and may God, God bless you and the United States of America. <laughs> Next up, we have Chief Paul Snell, Maplewood Police Department. Good morning. I come here today... Um, with the message that gun violence is not a those people problem. Um, in my community, uh, this, this past weekend, spilling over into um, our neighbor city in St. Paul, um, more than 70, more than 70 shots were fired uh, following a, a, a brief dispute between a couple of parties inside of a nightclub. Uh, so we see firsthand and the challenges that we face around trying to create common sense laws to address these issues. I hear today just to take a, a, just a, a few minutes to make highlight a, a couple of issues relative to the gun violence protection order that uh, is being proposed. We believe that this, this measure, simple measure, is a way for families who are concerned about a loved one who may be struggling and, and in the midst of a mental health crisis to be able to, to petition the court to have firearms removed from that person on a temporary basis yet ensuring all of the rights, that due process rights, that we in this country value so much. It would allow either family members, law enforcement, city or county attorneys, or legal guardians to petition the court to remove these guns. It would require that, that a, a, the court would receive a, an affidavit that would specify the reason for an emergency action to remove guns from that person. Due process is provided. In our state, for many, many years, we have had the opportunity for people to obtain 
orders for protection, domestic violence orders for protection um, on an ex parte basis, meaning without a court hearing. 14 days later, a hearing must be held, and that's the provisions that are built into the gun violence protection order, so due process is provided. Not long ago in my community, our officers responded after a family call concerned that, that their son, uh, a young adult son, had threatened to kill himself and cause harm to other family members. We responded, we transported that young man to the hospital, we took the firearms for safekeeping, and days later, after he was released from the hospital, he came to the police department and requested, demanded the return of his firearms. Prior to him uh, coming to get the firearms, we received a call from his family asking, pleading with us, please do not release the guns to him. It's not, he's not in a place where he can get those guns back. And there is no provision in the law for us to withhold those guns from that person. Ultimately, this, this simple, simple provision would allow us uh, to be able to help support families and keep our communities safer. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Tim Nelson, who's a gun violence survivor. Good morning. My name is Tim Nelson. I'm a 20-year Retired Air Force veteran, having flown B-52s for 10 years on active duty, including the Gulf War and the C-5s in the Air Force Reserve. I'm a lifelong hunter, a member of the NRA, and a conceal and carry permit holder. And I'm the person who called the FBI on Zacharias Musawi when he tried to get flight training on a 747 in 2001 trying to be one of the 20 hijackers of 9-11. And the FBI credits my call for them detaining him 27 days before 9-11. I believe in doing the right thing, no matter the personal cost. I also believe in the Second Amendment rights. I also believe there is a great responsibility that goes with those Second Amendment rights. We have an obligation to conduct ourselves in a law-abiding manner, especially when handling or in having access to firearms. But sometimes individuals have mental health issues that do not allow them to think or act rationally. And that is why we need to rely on family members, law enforcement, and the courts to develop a systematic way for them to keep people safe. I was dating Barbara Larson, and she was murdered by her ex-husband in December. We had both been divorced and were realizing we had found the one in each other. Her ex-husband was a retired Faribault police captain. And Barb had expressed concerns to me about his temper, his behavior, and her fear that he could harm her and others. On Friday, December 23rd, two days before Christmas, Barb's ex-husband went to her place of work at the Faribault Chamber of Commerce and murdered her and then took his own life less than 48 hours after having a restraining order served on him. Their sons, their two grandsons, extended family, and I are all devastated by the senseless act. Barb was married to her ex-husband for 35 years. She knew what he was capable of and watched his behavior grow more erratic and his temper more explosive. Barb felt that her only option for safety was a restraining order. That restraining order, however, didn't take his firearms away, and it did not keep her safe. Barb was the 17th person killed in Minnesota to domestic violence in 2016, and there was a second murder-suicide Faribault experienced in a two-week period. I stand here today because I know all too well we have to give families options for working with law enforcement and the courts to temporarily remove firearms from people so they can get help, help for the families and help for the individuals before it is too late. Members of the Minnesota legislature, you have a duty and an obligation to pass laws to protect the public and not create opportunity for more harm. Please support this gun violence protection order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Next up, we have Senator Dan Schoen uh, from Cottage Grove, and he's also a Cottage Grove police officer. 
Well, thank you very much. And, you know, I got to start out with how many times do you hear if you're not on the right side of the gun issue, you're not a patriot. And, uh, sir, I got to tell you, uh, I, I didn't know you were going to be here, and this is pretty fresh in December. I remember reading that story. And I'm sorry for your loss, and thank you. I mean, thank you to your country for what you did before. Unbelievable. <laughs> so I've got about 17 pages of notes here, so hang tight. <laughs> oh, listen, you know, I... I <laughs> Yeah, it does. We have session. So in 2014, Senator Latz and I uh, uh, passed uh, the gun violence restraining order bill in an overwhelming bipartisan fashion. And, you know, that bill is keeping the hands out of abusers in Minnesota. And we really got people to sit down and say, if you beat women and children, you shouldn't have guns. And everybody went, yeah, I guess you're right. Sometimes you have to oversimplify things, but there's no reason that we can't come together around this. And I'll tell you, I believe the passage of that bill turned the corner and opened the door for the state of Minnesota to start the common sense and moderate, common sense, moderate gun discussion about gun violence in Minnesota right here. That experience showed that we can talk together. We can talk to each other respectfully without the discussion of knee-jerk reaction that you were going to lose your rights to your firearms. It's just not happening. As you can see from the large group of individuals behind me, law enforcement, county and city attorneys, doctors, clergy, gun owners, survivors, moms, uh, dads, a diverse and thoughtful group of individuals are coming together to keep Minnesotans safe. We have heard from Senator Hayden, Representative Lee, about the Taylor Hayden Gun Violence Prevention Act. We've heard from Representative Pinto, Pinto about the gun violence protection order. And now we must talk about the way guns get into our system. In Minnesota, only federally licensed gun dealers must conduct criminal background checks on potential buyers to make sure that they are not legally prohibited from having guns. These account for only 60%, so just over half of the gun sales. All, the, all others happened without question at all. It's time to close the existing loopholes. Over 91% of background checks at licensed dealers take less than 90 seconds to complete. You stand in line at Caribou longer to get a cup of coffee than it takes to get a background check on a cup of coffee. And you probably pay more for the coffee. Since 1998, the criminal background check system has blocked millions of felons, other dangerous people from buying guns. Over 30,000 of them have been in Minnesota alone that system is working. In the 19 states, and these are the facts that matter, because people will tell you, well, what's the data? So there are 19 states. 46% fewer women are likely to be killed by intimate partners. 48% fewer law enforcement officers like me and like my partners are killed. 48% fewer are killed with handguns. And let... And if you're a parent who's lost a, a child, a friend, anybody in this room who has lost somebody to suicide, 48% fewer folks will commit suicide as a result with a firearm. I'm a licensed police officer, a legislator, and a Second Amendment supporter, and I can say with 100% certainty that support of the Second Amendment goes hand in hand with responsible gun ownership, much like Mr. Nelson. I'm calling on my colleagues in the legislature to stand up and, and listen to Minnesotans when we look at 80% think that this is the right thing to do. This is not new. I, I think, uh, Chief, maybe you can you know, talk about this too, but when I'm on work in the street and somebody calls and says, hey, where do I go? I want to sell my gun to my neighbor. So where do I go do this or that? I'm like, well, you can just walk over there and sell it. They're like, I don't have to do any paperwork. I said, no, and their first answer is, that doesn't seem right. And I said, I agree. And remember, we've taken some steps to even try to work with folks to say, what if we just do this at gun shows and I'll let you give it to a family member without a check? And we haven't been able to beat that back and we need your help. We need everybody's help. This shouldn't be complicated. And this is an attack on, on Second Amendment rights. We stood up. Like yesterday, 
because we have an opiate epidemic in this country. We're losing people left and right because of an opiate overdose epidemic. We are losing people left and right through, through gun violence, whether it's self-inflicted or otherwise. It's time to stand up and say, what other ways can we do this? Because that's what we do in other areas, and we do it cooperatively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Next up, we have St. Paul Police Chief Todd Exta. Chief. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today to talk about this incredibly important, impactful topic for our entire community. St. Paul is entirely too familiar with gun violence. Last year, shots fired were up in this city, in St. Paul, 28%. In January of this year alone, we responded to 118 reports of shots fired calls in the city of St. Paul. We've already taken more than 50 reports this year alone of aggravated assaults using firearms in those assaults in the city of St. Paul. And two people have lost their lives so far this year in St. Paul by gun violence. Gun violence is insidious. It leaves people with lifelong injuries. It tears families apart. You've heard the stories today. It creates neighborhoods that have fear. And that also is a public safety epidemic. We can simply do more to keep guns out of the hands of criminals. Addressing gun violence is a shared responsibility. The St. Paul Police Department is doing our part and our partnership with our community is incredibly important in doing that. Now we're asking private sellers to do their part along with us. As police chief of Minnesota's capital city, I support criminal background checks for all gun purchases. Currently, under federal law, guns sold by unlicensed private sellers are exempt from running criminal background checks for those sales. This allows anyone to sell a gun to anyone. And it creates loopholes in the uh, dangerous people such as felons and domestic abusers from getting guns. They're getting guns, and it's just unacceptable. This is happening online at gun shows, individual sales, and it never includes a criminal background check. The concern is real, and the concern is warranted. It's estimated 40% of all these guns are bought through private party transactions, and many of those guns are used to commit crimes and ruin the lives of our family members and our community members. My question is simply this. Why wouldn't we require criminal background checks on these guns? If we make our state safer and less violent, why wouldn't we do it? As Senator Schoen mentioned, that the stats are clear, but I want to repeat them because they're so important. And I, I encourage our media to really hit home on these stats because this is what's going to save the lives through our awareness. According to the Centers for Disease Control and the FBI, 50% of all Americans live in states that require criminal background checks for all gun sales. Half of our country already do this. And that half of the country, here's what's happening. The number of women shot to death by their intimate partners is reduced by 46%. Look to my right. This could be preventable. People committing suicide with guns drop 48%. Everybody here knows somebody who's committed suicide. And there have been 48% fewer law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty by guns. These numbers don't lie. They are what they are. We need criminal background checks. We need to keep everyone safe. And as the chief of St. Paul, I am fully committed in doing this. And I just want to add one small thing. You're looking at a kid that grew up in Silver Bay, Minnesota. After school, my brother and I, we'd grab our shotgun, we'd go out grouse hunting. I'm telling you, I promise you, this will not prevent those lawful activities. Don't be afraid of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Next up, we have my good friend, Senator Ron Lance. Senator Hayden, Mrs. Hayden, and your family, um, and, and all of you who are standing uh, with me here today, some of you have been here with me before. You know, I'm getting really tired of having to come to these press conferences. 
really tired. Not only are they long, <laughs> um, but we have to do it over and over again to get the same message out, not to the people of Minnesota, who we know from objective, independent polling data support what we want to do with this kind of legislation. By overwhelming numbers, by the way, 82% of Minnesotans support full universal background checks on all firearm purchases. We don't have to convince the people of Minnesota. We have to convince the leadership in certain quarters in the legislature to listen to the people of Minnesota and pass these bills. And I promise you, we're going to keep at it. The single most effective thing that we can do to prevent the kind of deaths that we're talking about here today is to pass bills like this, is to keep the guns out of hands of felons, out of the hands of domestic abusers, and out of the hands of people who are suffering from dangerous mental illnesses. You're not going to catch them. You're not going to find out if the purchaser has a dangerous background, has been convicted of homicide, of murder, or of serious domestic violence unless you do a background check. I mean, how common sense is that? If you don't ask any questions, you're never going to get any answers. And these electronic background checks are very simple to do. I want to tell you what the background check bill doesn't do. It doesn't create any registry anywhere of who owns the guns. It doesn't take away anyone's guns. It doesn't restrict the kind of guns that a person can buy or own. It doesn't add any onerous or expensive oversight procedure to the purchase of a gun in Minnesota. And it doesn't in any way expand Minnesota's gun laws. It simply identifies those who are already in current law prohibited from possessing guns so that they are not allowed to make that purchase that they're applying for. Very simple. If you already have a lawful background, you need not worry about this bill. Not one bit. But if you are a convicted violent felon, yes, you should worry about this bill. <laughs> and rightfully so. And I dare anyone on any side of the aisle, any member of the legislature, to stand up and say that we ought to simply hand guns to someone who is a convicted violent felon. It's already been identified that 60% of guns are purchased with background checks in Minnesota. More importantly, 40% are not. That's a big hole. If you go to the airport today and you want to get on a plane to Houston or to Atlanta, and if 40% of the passengers didn't have to go through that security screening, would you get on the plane? Would you get on the plane? I'm probably the chief author of both the background check bill and the gun violence protective order bill, and we're going to keep at it. I don't expect, frankly, that we're going to make much progress this year because I think there are other items on the agenda. Um, and we're running into roadblocks in all the usual places. But we're not only trying to play offense here this year, we've got to play defense. Defense can be pretty tough. We've got bills that have been introduced that would remove all safe zones from those who have permits to carry. That would tell Minnesotans that you can bring your gun that you are carrying into our elementary schools, that you can bring them into our churches and synagogues and mosques, that you can bring them into our hospitals and that you can bring them into the state fair. 
Now think about the state fair. Cheese curds, a giant slide, beer, and guns. And a lot of people, many of whom don't look like you or me, because we get the complete cross-section of Minnesota shows up. Is that the kind of mix that we're really comfortable in if people are allowed to bring their guns into the state fair because they've got a permit to carry? Now think about this, if that permit to carry is never renewed, it's a lifetime permit to carry. So if you got your permit to carry 10 years ago and in between here, you killed your wife, you could still have your permit to carry and bring your gun into your child's elementary school. Because there's another bill out there that would make it a lifetime carry law in Minnesota, which just boggles the mind. It really does. People change, circumstances can't change. Whether you've got a gun or not, People who are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, they commit their first crime of violence on occasion at every stage of life, whatever the circumstances are. Maybe it's a really terrible divorce. You know, maybe it's years of buildup of conflict with a neighbor over feeding deer in the yard. But whatever it is, it happens. And if the law gets passed, it says you can still have your permit to carry for life. We may never find out if there's a background, if there's not a background check done when you apply to renew your permit to carry. Now, get this, even more dramatic, a bill that would remove, delete from the statutes, the permit to carry requirement at all, whatsoever would allow you just to carry your gun anywhere you want, anytime you want, without even any permit to carry that. And, and this is not a conceal and carry law, by the way. It says nothing about concealing that firearm on you. It's open carry if you wish it to be open carry. It just allows you to carry it. And if you don't even have to go through the initial background check at whatever age you are to get that permit to carry, then there's absolutely no restraint whatsoever. You want to go back to the Wild West? In some communities, uh, they're already experiencing that. Maplewood, 60 shots in one incident. So we have a lot of defense to play. And I don't know what's going to happen in the House this year. Um, I don't anticipate that we're going to see these bills in the Senate uh, this year. Listen, dead, first deadlines are in two weeks. Um, but they'll be there. And when the opportunity's right, and when they feel the door is open, those bills will come out. Now there's one other, and I know that uh, law enforcement is particularly concerned about this too, which is the stand your ground bill. We've seen this before in Minnesota. The problem is we've seen this around the country, so we know how it works or doesn't work to protect public safety. You know, Byron Smith in Little Falls defended himself with basically that premise and shot two young cousins as they came into his home. In a domestic violence situation, all a defendant would have to say is, well, I felt threatened by my domestic partner. And that would be a legal justification for using deadly force. And those teenage boys in Carver County a few weeks back who were playing keep away with a winter hat, when their neighbor came out and fired his gun three times because he felt threatened. And who's going to be the first person who dies because they got disoriented coming home and try to get into the wrong house by mistake. You know, they try to open the front door and someone inside gets scared and just fires blindly through the door. Or maybe it's their own son or daughter or spouse who forgot their key and their purse in their car. And they're trying to get in 
back door, the internal garage door that might be locked, and they can't get in. Someone nervous inside, afraid inside, might just shoot their own child. All they'd have to do to defend themselves in court is say they felt threatened. Now, that just doesn't make any sense to me. We have robust self-defense laws in Minnesota already. And someone can use deadly force in public right now if they felt that they were threatened uh, in such a way. Uh, but they also have a duty if they can to back away and find a safe alternative to using deadly force. The Stand Your Ground Bill would reduce that, would eliminate that duty. We want to see increases in homicides. It's been documented around the country, in Texas, in Florida. Homicides increased 32% by firearms in states that have Stand Your Ground, like Florida. A Texas A&M study found that in the 21 states with Stand Your Ground laws, there were 600 more homicides per year. Tampa Bay Times found at least 26 children and teens have been killed in Florida Stand Your Ground cases since 2005. And these Stand, ground, stand Your Ground laws have a disproportionate effect on communities of color. When white shooters kill black victims, the resulting homicides are deemed justifiable 11 times more frequently than when the shooter is black and the victim is white. 11 times more frequently they get off scot-free. And in Florida, these cases with minority victims are half as likely to lead to conviction. Half as likely to lead to conviction. These laws also have had no evidence that they deter crime in any way. They don't deter crime. So the evidence is in. We just need to make sure that we are effective in blocking these laws from ever passing in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Latt. I know the time is running short, but I do want to have uh, Lucy McBath come. Uh, she is every town spokesman on gun violence and a gun violence survivor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hayden. I'd first like to offer you and my family my, your, my deepest condolences and those, all of you that stand here with me who've also, who've also been uh, victims of gun violence. I offer my condolences to you because I too completely understand your pain. Good morning. My name is Lucy McBath and I'm humbled to be here today representing Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America and Every Town for Gun Safety and standing with the Haydens who have been leaders in the community and longtime champions of gun violence prevention. We're here today to remember and to honor the life of Taylor Hayden, who was shot and killed in my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, on July 23rd, 2016. I'd like to start by taking a moment to honor the countless lives taken from this senseless gun violence and to recognize survivors who might be with us here in the audience today. If any of you in the audience have suffered gun violence or your victims, please Please stand. Thank you. Just over four years ago, I found myself on a path I did not choose, fighting a battle I never expected to fight, advocating to change dangerous gun laws that I never even knew existed. My son, Jordan Davis, who was just 17 years old, was shot and killed by an armed man in Florida in a dispute over loud music. My son, too, was shot under the Stand Your Ground law in Florida. Jordan was unarmed and seated in the back seat of a friend's car when the man opened fire, robbing him of his young life and me of my only child. I can remember just very quickly one of the last discussions that I ever had with Jordan 
when we were listening to Trayvon Martin's uh, case, and Jordan stood in my bedroom with me one day, and he said, Mom, Mom, why do people just want to gun each other down? Why don't people talk about their problems anymore? And I remember saying to him, Jordan, sweetheart, you have to be very, very careful because nowadays people do not aim for reasonable conflict resolution. Today, people will take their guns out and they will shoot you. And that conversation with Jordan haunts me every single day of my life because my son died that very way. The Hayden family has also suffered a great, a great loss. Their beloved daughter and sister Taylor was only 25 years old when she was killed. Taylor was a vibrant young woman with her entire life and career ahead of her. She had recently moved to Texas and was on a girls' weekend getaway to Atlanta when she was shot and killed by a stray bullet intended for someone else. Her murder remains unsolved to this very day. And yet, her family stands united with their community, finding purpose through their pain. I'm inspired by the Haydens and the survivors that are here today and their resolve to bring common sense solutions to Minnesota. Every day in America, more than 93 percent, I mean, excuse me, 93 people are killed with guns and hundreds more are injured. And we know that gun violence disproportionately affects women and communities of color. Here in Minnesota, these facts are very, very real. In the last decade of available data, 722 Minnesota residents were killed with guns. There is a deadly relationship between guns and violence against women in, in Minnesota. More than 56% of the domestic violence homicides in the state were committed using a gun. In the last five years, at least 48 women were shot to death by current or former intimate partners, according to a series of reports from the Minnesota Coalition of Battered Women. Firearms also play a key role in suicides in Minnesota, as we've heard earlier today, where nearly four out of five firearm deaths in the last decade were suicides. And in 2015, 304 Minnesotans died by suicide using a firearm. In hearing these startling numbers, it's important for us to remember that this is not a hopeless case. This is not a hopeless issue. That there are solutions out there that will reduce the violence that we know all too well. Simple common sense Public safety laws like background checks reduce gun violence and they actually do save lives. And that these measures receive overwhelming support from the general public. Recent polling from the Star Tribune shows that 82% of Minnesotans support background checks on every gun sale. And nationally, polls consistently show that more than 90% of the country, including 82% of gun owners and 74% of NRA members support requiring criminal back background checks on anyone that intends to buy a gun. We must remember our common ground. We've come far in the gun violence prevention movement here in Minnesota, but still have a fight ahead of us with the introduction of some very dangerous bills this legislative session. I commend and stand in solidarity with the Hayden family today and the other leaders standing here today for standing up for public safety and working to affect change on gun violence in Minnesota. And again, I'm more than honored to be here with you today. And ladies and gentlemen, there is an assault on the preservation of human life in America. Stand up and challenge that. Your futures depend on it. We need you. Thank you. And then we have Jamie, Jamie Tincher, Chief of Staff of the Governor, Mark Dayton, to read a resolution. Thank you. Good morning, so Senator. Ms. Hayden, 